I'm just going to kick everything off. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we thought the room wasn't really big enough for a sound system, so I hope it works out. Um, just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, as always, it's incredible to see this many like-minded Republicans in a room together. Um, you know, it's you guys that drive democracy. The, the people in this room that care enough to come out and hear what these guys believe and why they're running and, and, and the things that they're going to do for our state. It's those kind of decisions that drive the democracy that drives our country. So thank you for being involved. Thank you for being here. I want to thank all of our candidates for showing up and, and taking time out of their schedule to come share with us their vision for the state. Um, we're, we're honored to have you guys. You know, many of you have served our state, um, you know, different districts and statewide offices and, and a lot of different things. So we thank all of you for your service. Um, kind of the way things will go tonight is we'll have um, some local state representatives and different state candidates speak. Um, and then we'll have local candidates. We'll recognize any local candidates for about 30 seconds that we'd like to stand up and tell um, you know, their name, what they're running for. Um, and then after we do the local candidates, we'll transition into hearing from our three main speakers, um, Scott Dawson, Will Langsworth, and our U.S. Congressman Mo Brooks. So, um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and transition into a prayer. We're going to start out with having Representative Horton come up and do a, a prayer for us. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think he, he decided I needed more prayer, so he asked me to do the prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Everybody please bow. Thank Heavenly Father for the sort of for today. Thank you for dying on the cross for all our sins, Heavenly Father. And thank you for everyone being here today. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that you lead us home safely and uh, and guide us in the right direction. We just give you all the glory and praise and thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So the first candidate we're going to have come up um, is uh, our state senator from this district. He's did so much to help the young Republicans. We're, we're honored to have his support and, and his um, efforts behind us and everything that we do. Um, there's many of these candidates that wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without them. So uh, without further ado, Steve Libby's. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight, and I, I want to thank the young Republicans for coming out and doing this, because four years ago when we started running here, there were just a handful of us here. We, we, we could fit in a small bathroom closet somewhere back then, and now everybody's out and working and working hard. And what they do for us is really important, as you well know, Congressman knows, Representative Haines and Representative uh, Hainsworth know, and Representative Horton know what they do for you, because they put the signs out, they do a lot of the legwork, and we really appreciate you guys for for everything you do. I think it's my job to welcome everybody here tonight. It's been a glorious day in Alabama today, especially Northeast Alabama, right, Congressman? That's right. Go Google. Go Google, right. <laughs> we had Miss Baden stand up there, who is a University of Alabama graduate, who is leading to the Google Cloud Development Team, and she said roll tide this morning. So I think it's really, really fantastic, a great day. You know, it's not a lot of jobs. It's 100 jobs, roughly, with a $600 million investment. The neat thing about Google is that the following investments that come with uh, the data centers seem to follow data centers, and, and uh, that, that's Willis Creek Steam Plant is not the same site that we have seen just, just a short year ago, so we're excited about the possibilities there. Excited about our possibilities at Belmont Congress. I know we've got a lot of hard work to do, right, Mark? Uh, to get that, but we've still, we're excited about that. So. I don't want to keep you too long. I, you know, I, I was a candidate in 2014. I ran on the fact that I wanted to right-size Alabama government, make it easier for Alabama businesses to do business inside of Alabama. I think with what's happened across the southeast, or across Alabama in particular, you look at uh, Boeing in Huntsville, and Toyota Mazda, and Mercedes down in Birmingham, or Vance as the case may be, Google here in Jackson County, Airbus down in Mobile. We've done some things that's right. Now we've got some more things we need to clean up, and I'd appreciate your support again in, in, on June 5th of 2018. So thank you very much. Next off, we're going to have a, another state representative who represents Jackson County, uh, Mr. Richie Horton. Well, thank you for having us here. Thank you for everyone coming uh, this evening. Uh, I'm going to take a lot of time, but uh, we'll say this. Uh, in the State House and, and in the Senate also, there's tough votes to make out there. Tough things, tough decisions that you have to make. Uh, not necessarily 
do you have to get a permanent crowd to speak well? That, that's not uh, that's not all there is to it. I mean, there's really tough, hard decisions you have to make, and one of the toughest uh, decisions I had to make. Uh, I had one of, one of the House reps come to me and ask if I would sign a resolution to uh, investigate uh, Governor Bentley. And it, it's a pretty tough, hard thing to do, and, and you have to make some hard decisions, but you know, I was one of the 12 that agreed to sign the resolution and to uh, investigate. And of course you see what happens with that. Uh, there's some good things that go on down there, there's some bad things that go on down there. And, 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 uh, you have to be a stand-up guy, and you have to make the right decisions. And uh, hey, that's that's what I do while I'm there. I, I try to make the right decisions, try to make the tough decisions. And uh, hey, I, so, I, I think that's why I was called to be there. So it, I'm grateful for you, and I, I appreciate your support, and your vote. Thank you very much. <laughs> The next state representative we'll have up is he's did a lot for Jackson County, um, and you know, Tommy, you've did you know a lot for this area, um, and, and there's not many people that when they tell you they're going to do something, they'll do everything they can to get it done like Tommy will. So I want to welcome you at this time, Tommy Haynes. I'm like the senator and the representative. I'm not going to take a lot of time. I want to thank the young Republicans uh, for having this tonight. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm really proud of them for the fact that we have so many young people right here in Jackson County that care about their state and their country. I mean, they're really dedicated and they're, they're very conservative, a very conservative group. Uh, today was a great day for us in Jackson County. When Governor Ivey came and the Google people came and we had the groundbreaking here today in Bridgeport. Folks, on a local level, this is going to open the door for Jackson County, Alabama. It, uh, it's planted the seed for us. There's going to be so much growth, I believe, in the next 10 years, you're not going to know Jackson County. I believe that the, uh, the business district is going to be from the state line at, at Bridgeport to Scottsboro. So you better get your cell phones out, go down 72 Highway, take pictures of every one of those fields. Because in 10 years' time, there's going to be something sticking in every one of them. It's a great day for us. It's a great day for us. It, we have a, a bright future. I only hope that the Lord lets me live long enough to see it. But uh, I'm running again here this year. And I, I, June 5th, I'd really appreciate everybody's support. Thank you very much. next candidate we'll hear from before we uh, transition into some of our local candidates uh, is Deborah Jones. Um, she's a candidate for the Alabama Supreme Court. And I met Deborah down in Anniston when I was going to Jackson State and um, I know down in Anniston everybody loves her and, and she's got a good um, good reputation there. So Deborah Jones. Thank you. That's right. It is very good to be with y'all and you know our college is Jacksonville State University and three weeks ago it was really torn apart by seven tornadoes. My daughter graduates next month and she was planning on going to J JSU which she still will but she was interested in nursing. The entire nursing building is gone and it has been three weeks and they still have not returned to school. Actually today was the first day when they were able to even have class. The apartment buildings have been demolished, uh, damaged, and we were so blessed that just by the mercy of the Lord that our college students were on spring break and so we didn't have one fatality and if there's any you know silver lining in that awful situation that was it but it's been three weeks they're still trying to get power and getting temporary uh, classrooms Kitty Stone Elementary uh, we had a new school built so the old school they were in there painting and getting ready to uh, hold class so y'all just keep remembering us in prayer over that situation but yes, uh, we are going to rebuild and we're going to be just fine. Y'all are represented so well in Montgomery by your representatives and your senator. I talk with them a lot. Tommy Haynes is on the phone with me all the time, and I just really appreciate your support and your endorsement. It means a lot to me. There is a big rally in Mobile tonight with a lot of statewide candidates, and I had a pastor cover that for me because I wanted to be here, because this part of the state is near and dear to me. This is probably my fourth or fifth time here, and I really want your 
your support. You do not have a North Alabama judge on the Alabama Supreme Court right now. You do not have any representation at all. I want you to vote for me, first, because I'm the most qualified, but second, because it would be an honor to represent you as another North Alabama citizen in Montgomery on the Supreme Court. It matters who sits on that court because every decision, every contract in business, every controversial law will wind up there. And you want someone sitting on that court who shares your same Christian values and who thinks like you think. And we just think a little bit differently up here in North Alabama. Now, I went to Alabama undergraduate, and then I went to Cumberland Law School. I've been married 26 years. I want to introduce you to my family. This is my husband and my five children. This is a great time for me to serve. I had five babies in eight and a half years, so I spent the last 20-something years raising babies, being at the ball field, games on Saturday, church on Sunday and Wednesday. I taught Sunday school, mission friends, Sunday night. So you can imagine what a busy life that we have had. A wonderful, fulfilled life. And it is now time for me to serve on the state level. When I was in the district attorney's office, I started right out of law school. I served there for four years. I wrote the felony DUI law. That law makes it a felony for anybody who's uh, arrested for drunk driving after they have been previously convicted in district court three separate times. And that law got a lot of chronic drunk drivers off of the road. And if any of you have ever been involved in a wreck with a drunk driver or your family members, you are glad that we have that law. Then I also wrote the Sexual Torture Act. That law makes it a Class A felony for anyone to rape another person with an object. I know that sounds terrible, but we did not have that law. And as a prosecutor, I had two children that I couldn't do anything about because we needed that law. So I went to Montgomery and we got that law passed. And then my sister was the victim of a violent kidnapping and rape. She was stabbed nine times when she was 18 years old. She was left for dead. And I helped her start the Rape Crisis Center for free counseling for rape victims at the hospital in the middle of the night. You know, the officers are called to take the statement, and they really don't want to have to deal with that, but they do. But then you need a trained counselor to deal with the victim and the trauma that they have just gone through. She is doing well now. I say that today because this is the National Crime Victims Week. President Trump declared it on Sunday, and it goes through the week. So I just wanted to honor her and all that she does in saying that to you today. She is a rape crisis counselor. She also runs a um, um, rehabilitation home for women that are on drugs that are involved in the court system. And she has 20 people that she is ministering to to try to get their lives uh, built uh, and rebuilt and restored. Then when I went into private practice, my husband and I started Mercy House, which is a faith-based domestic violence shelter had a lot of clients who were uh, victims of domestic violence with small children. They didn't have money or places to go, and so we saw that need, and we uh, got four families together, and we created a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, and we got volunteers, and uh, we provided that for them, and it was a really good uh, ministry for those people as well. Everywhere you are, whether you're in business or whether you're an attorney, there is always a need. And there is always an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I have tried to do that my whole life, no matter where I was serving. After I served for 16 years, I ran for circuit judge, and I was elected in 2010, and I was reelected in 2016. I've always been very active in my Republican parties. I have two counties, Calhoun and Cleburne counties, and so I have a Republican party for each county that I'm active in. And we have a Republican women's group. It's called the Chee Hall Republican Women that serves the region. And I've been very active in that group as well. I am running for the Supreme Court because I care about good government. I care about integrity in our court system. We have nine justices on the Alabama Supreme Court. And in June, five of those justices will be on the ballot. So I'm running for place one. There are two other judges in the race that are on the ballot. They are Republican judges. They are South Alabama, Mobile, and Dothan. We do not have a Democrat in the race, so June 5th 
will decide our race. So I ask for your vote. I need 50% plus one for place one. So I ask that you be the one vote. Deborah Jones, place one. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, Deborah. You know, you, you mentioned something that I just want to highlight momentarily before we move on to our next candidate. Um, you know, faith-based rehabilitation programs is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I think there's not a single family in this room that hasn't been touched by drug addiction in some form or fashion. And I think when you pair Christ with those issues, it really changes the way that those people deal with those issues. So it's great to see people can't highlight that and working towards helping those programs. And let me just say one more thing about that. Our circuit, we have several faith-based drug rehabilitation programs that we work with, and all three of our jury trial judges order people as part of their probation to spend a year in those faith-based drug rehab programs. You know, that's, you know, if they had to go to prison. And it costs our taxpayers zero, nothing. So it, it's there, it's a service, they get those people jobs, they transport them to work, they have a meeting every night that deals with uh, faith-based recovery, and they drug test them, and they're accountable to the court. So why would we not use that rather than send someone uh, using drugs to prison where they're just going to get more drugs? Now those chronic drug uh, cases and the drug pushers, those are handled in a different manner. But I would encourage everybody to uh, support those programs, and I hope that you get to them in your community as well. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, last statewide candidate we'll feature tonight is going to be Mr. Wayne Reynolds. I know many of you know him. He's running for the State Board of Education. Now, I'm not going to touch long because the important people are yet to speak. I'm running for the State Board of Education. I'm a lifetime educator. And my wife is, my wife of 48 years, she was seven when we got married, so. <laughs> she said, Stand up, Carol, because I mean, I'm not that good looking. Carol and I, we live in Africa. <laughs> our career in education. And I'm running for this position because the one thing that we need to have more effective is, is good representation who knows education and who will work for education. You're, I've talked to your state senators and your <coughs> But, and I've talked to your city superintendent, and I know he, nobody's happier here about Google than him. Because he and I talked about the problem that Scottsboro has of going from 3,500 students to 2,800. That's a difficult time, and he's not getting much assistance. But I've been to every county, met every superintendent, been to a lot of school boards, been to your county uh, commission meeting, and I love the opportunity to work because the state board person is not just for the state board. If I don't work with your congressional delegation, all of our, 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 our representatives, they don't really have good input. I had the chance to meet with the, the, a number of them this one night, and I know what I'm doing. I'm a Vietnam veteran. 50 years ago today, I was flying on a medevac helicopter in Vietnam. And uh, thank God, God brought me home. and. Uh, if you haven't gotten a card, I'm not taking a lot of your time because I know these more eloquent men are speaking. But I'm against Common Core. I'm against people dictating to us. That, is, that has been detrimental to education. And, and I think that one of the worst things that's hurting our schools and anybody that's around has been this evaluation system that's been put on us that has schools in my district that make F. Now, Mr. Lee, you could not imagine teaching in a school or having your child go to a school who's impacted by various resources and the State Department of Education does some sort of manipulation to evaluate them and give them an F. And I have 10 years as a superintendent and I know it will ruin you. And I, I even met Mr. Sisk when he was running around, when he was stuck in Washington. My, my whole desire and my Christian commitment is to help others. And that's what I'm running for. You can see my bio and my background, and I'll let these, these more important men speak. But if you hadn't gotten my card, if you raise my hand, I'll sit down if you'll promise to take my card. Does anybody <laughs> have <laughs> my
Mr. Reynolds for sharing with us. Um, what we'll do at this time is I want to hear, I know there's a lot of local candidates in the room. Uh, what we're going to do, if you wouldn't mind uh, standing up, just keeping it to about 30 seconds if you don't mind, um, but just kind of telling your name, what you're running for, and a quick a piece about why. Would anybody like to start us off? I'll start. My name's Keisha Gardner, and I'm running for Jackson County Circuit Clerk. I'm running because I care about Jackson County and because I care about our court system. I'm a foster parent. I have been for the past 10 years, and our court system means a lot to me. As you've heard today, uh, a lot of us got to go to the Google uh, groundbreaking ceremony, and Jackson County is growing by leaps and bounds, and it's important that you look at the candidates for what they are for their qualifications, and because they're going to be your next elected officials for the next four or six years. And um, my background is business management, and uh, I, I just I have the qualifications. I'm not going to go through those because I know you said 30 seconds, so I'm trying to speak uh, <laughs> fast. But uh, I care about Jackson County. I care about uh, the court system, and I want to be your next circuit clerk. Um, I heard uh, Tommy talk about planting the seed. I heard uh, one of them talk about growing. I think we need to elect a gardener. There you go. <laughs> Any other candidates? I'm Terry Stone. I'm running for chairman of the Jackson County Commission, and I want to be the one to take the challenge to push Jackson County farther. Thank you, sir. Hi, it's Jason Edward. I'm running for sheriff of Jackson County. Uh, currently, I'm the police chief of Hollywood. And I've grown the department uh, substantially since I've taken over. And with the county growing, our, our crime is also going to enhance. That's inevitable. I feel like our sheriff's department needs to grow in technology and training. And uh, I want to push the sheriff's office in the right direction in the future. Thank you. Other local candidates? Okay. I'm Chris Gully. I'm a candidate for the <coughs> Jackson County Commission. Uh, I'm a lifelong public servant. I'm an Army veteran from the uh, uh, Desert Storm era. Uh, I've been in volunteer fire service for 27 years. I've been I've been a public servant. I've got a service heart. I've been a public servant all my adult life on, on the volunteer level. Uh, I've served on the Jackson County Healthcare Authority for 12 years, uh, appointed under two different commissioners, so I must have been doing something right to be under two different commissioners. We all know how the hard the commissioners are here this in this county, but uh, <laughs> they appointed two different times, uh, served two terms. I served nine of those years as chairman. Uh, hospital always operating in black, and I want to take uh, my experience and, and my vision that I had for uh, just everything in life and apply it to the county commission and see how I can uh, input myself to help the county move forward. Thank you. Other local candidates? I'm Clinton Hale. I'm on the county commission district one. I've been uh, self-employed for 26 years. Side run for county commissioner. So, thank you. Okay, Mark. Go ahead. I'm Bart Buchanan. <coughs> I'm running for uh, circuit clerk. <coughs> Excuse me. Been in law enforcement going on 25 years, and uh, the biggest satisfaction I have had in my career is going an extra mile to help people. And the biggest honor I've had, it's like the judge was saying, is being a voice for victims who can't speak. That's the biggest joy I've had in this in this in my career. And uh, simply my background for this job is people. And that's what this job is about, is about people. So and that's simply why I'm running because my law enforcement career might be coming to an end, but I'm not done serving the people of this county yet. So anyway, that's that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Kyle Shelton, second circuit clerk of Jackson County. I've been with the Scottsdale Police Department for 18 years now. I've been with the City Council of Skyline for about 12. I just want to ask everybody for a vote. Thank you. I'm Victor Manning. I'm your incumbent probate judge for Jackson County, and, and uh, I've absolutely been thrilled to serve for five years. I'm sorry I missed you the other day. <coughs> um, but um, I love our county and I love our people, and I have truly loved serving. So remember me on June the 5th. Thank you.
I'm uh, Tony Wallingsford. I apologize for being late. Uh, I'm uh, finishing my term as uh, president of Scottsboro City Council at this time. Uh, I am uh, in the race for Jackson County Circuit Clerk. My background, I spent 20 years in uh, the technology industry assisting government and corporate clients automate their business process. <laughs> and I'd like to take that experience into the circuit clerk's office. So, thank you. I if there's no one else, um, thank all of you for speaking, um, and, and to everyone here, you know, I think a lot of our local candidates go sometimes under-recognized and under-appreciated, um, you know, these men and women, the fact that they're willing to, to go through a primary and go through an election means a lot, and, and it means that, that they're willing to serve you, and, and all the people here tonight are Republicans, and they're on the good side. Uh, they fight for the good guys, so whatever happens after June 5th, make sure that you're fighting hard in, in, in Northeast Alabama and make sure that our um, candidates get elected. So um, thank all you guys again for sharing. Uh, next up, uh, we'll have our U.S. Congressman for District 4, Mr. Mo Brooks. Um, I want to thank you. You know, like, like Tommy said, we as an organization are really proud of our conservative values and we really hold those very true to our hearts and you know, we believe wholeheartedly that, that limited government is, is the best future for our country. And I don't know many um, U.S. congressmen who have fought harder for the true conservative values that represent Alabama than Mr. Mo Brooks. So thank you. I'd like to thank the other Republicans for putting this event together. It's very important for our voters to actually be able to meet candidates and get a first-hand impression as opposed to what we often get through the news media or over the internet. Believe it or not, some of that stuff really is fake news. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and my family. My wife of uh, 40, gosh, make sure I get the math right, 41 years. Uh, Martha, uh, Martha, would you stand? Uh, we're the proud parents of four kids. The proud parents of four kids, three kids in law, and most importantly, eight grandchildren with two more on the way. <laughs> and the, the really neat thing about our larger family is that all of them have been able to find employment in the Tennessee Valley. We have been doing great guns, okay? Talk about Google, that's great for Jackson County. Move over into Madison County, uh, next door. We've done very well with Remington. We've had Boeing expansions. We've had the Toyota Motor Facility expansion. Moved next door over to Limestone County. Uh, we've had great success there. Most recently, Toyota Mazda. We've also had Polaris. Morgan County, you've seen their industrial uh, sector of their economy growing. Uh, companies like Newcore Steel are getting stronger and stronger, paying really good wages. And it's because of all the elected officials that we have that have worked so well together. For example, we're looking at this front row here with Tommy and Steve and uh, Richard, okay? Uh, I, I'll get to you, Will, but you're not in my district. <laughs> I wanted Marshall County in my district, but the legislature didn't see fit to put him there. <laughs> but uh, all these folks have done a great job, and I think of it somewhat like this. When you've got a horse that's winning races, why do you want to change that horse? What you do is you keep riding it. And so we've got a very good team across the board. I see my good friend Wayne Reynolds here. Got to meet Scott uh, today. Good luck in your uh, gubernatorial race. Some of you newcomers, I'm going to give you one bit of advice. Mental attitude, very important in a campaign. To me, the best advice I can get you is to think about it from this perspective. The worst that can happen is you win, because then you got to do the job. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have that kind of mental perspective, I assure you that you'll do fine, win or lose, uh, in this campaign. Uh, a little bit about my conservative bona fides. We get a lot of people who talk about uh, they're conservatives, right? I mean, that's the mantra in a Republican primary. What I suggest that you do is try to find out who's really talking the talk versus who's really walking the walk. In that vein, if you want to know something about how I've acted as your United States Congressman, if you prefer a conservative versus one of those fairly big spending establishment guys who's beholden to the special interest groups, look at my rating with uh, the Heritage Foundation's political arm, Heritage Action. Or last session of Congress, I was in the top 10 out of 435. If you're concerned about border security, look at Numbers USA. 
where I've been number one out of 435 for seven consecutive years on border security from day one. Look at the American Conservative Union, the National Taxpayers Union, if you're concerned about this deficit and debt uh, that we face as a nation. If you're concerned about individual liberty, look at Freedom Works. And you'll find that I'm up there near the top on every single grading score of these folks who pay attention uh, to these particular set of issues. So with me, you've got a proven track record that you can look at. Now I'm going to get into something that's really doggone depressing, okay? And that's your country's finances. And I hate to shift gears so abruptly, but by golly, this is the biggest national security threat, the biggest threat to our country that we've faced since the 1860s. Look at what Secretary of Defense Mattis stated during his uh, confirmation hearing in the United States Senate last year. Look at what uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Barack Obama, Admiral Mike Mullen, stated to the House Armed Services Committee in 2011. The number one national security threat was not Russia or China or North Korea or Iran or Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. According to them, it was our deficit and debt because they have the ability, deficit and debt, to strip us of the money that is necessary to have the world's greatest national defense. So they were spot on. And here's the problem that we're facing right now. We, you remember Ronald Reagan? Well, some of you don't, okay? I was his spokesman in North Alabama, so I do, and I've got the gray hair to prove that I was around back then. Um, during one of the debates, he quipped about how the Democrats are spending money like a drunken sailor. Well, we've got a lot of establishment Republicans who are doing the same thing because they're so desperate to win an election. And they're trying to copy what Democrats do because they think that will inoculate them against the Democrat charges in those general elections. Folks, we've got to do what our country needs us to do. And we have been falling short. The Democrats are off the charts for their spending. And the Republicans now, to a very large degree, are copying what the Democrats are doing. And there's only one outcome, and it's horrific. Let me share with you some data. Right now, $21 trillion in total public debt. $21 trillion, okay? That's a lot of money. But the future perspective is even more daunting. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office came out with a report today that indicated that we're looking at about a 13, 12 to $13 trillion debt increase over the next 10 years. So that will be around $32, $33.5 uh, trillion dollars in total accumulated debt. We got to pay that sooner or later. What is happening is we are mortgaging our country's future. Now there's a, a passage in Proverbs that talks about the debtor-creditor relationship. And really, it says that the debtor converts the creditor into the master and the debtor into the slave. And that is what we are doing right now where we are empowering our creditors to control our public policy and the direction that we want to go as a country. If our creditors were to cut us off today, I'm not talking about where they say, we want all the money back, we've already loaned you that $21 trillion. I'm talking about where they just say, we're not going to loan you any more money tomorrow. And you know, our creditors have every right to do that. And our biggest individual credit, by the way, is a geopolitical foe by the name of China. We would be, according to the Congressional Budget Office, if their estimate for this fiscal year is accurate, $800 billion short of what is necessary to finance the federal government. $804 billion, if my memory serves me correctly. I was scanning through it uh, today while I was in Jackson County for some other events. <laughs> now, what does that mean? Well, according to the Constitution, we have to pay our debt service. That's number one. So that's bills as they become due, i.e. loans that we've already made, and they've expired, and we have to pay the principal back, plus the interest of around 250 to $300 billion, which, by the way, over the next decade, we get closer and closer to a trillion dollars a year in interest. That's what the CBO is warning. It's not quite a trillion, but it's getting there. Then number two are the entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, 87 wealth transfer programs of about $800 billion a year. I know I'm giving you data. I apologize for that, but you have to understand the numbers to understand how dangerous this is. Under federal law, if you meet these criteria, you're entitled to that money. So if the federal government says, no, we're not going to pay it, a federal judge is going to say, yes, you are. If you've got it, you've got to pay it. So what does that leave now from whence that $800 billion shortfall comes if our creditors just say we're not going to lend you more money tomorrow? 
That's our discretionary spending of $1.3 billion. You know what about half of that is? National defense. You're talking about a roughly 60% cut if you were to prorate it like the state of Alabama does, if that's the methodology used, and I don't know if that would be, but it's about a 60% cut across the board for everything discretionary. That's transportation infrastructure. That's national security. That's FBI, well, maybe FBI right now. That might be, well, I'll let y'all worry about that. The Justice Department. Everything that the federal government does with those alphabet soup agencies, 60% across the board would be the average share. Think about the adverse effect that that would have, particularly on national security, and also think about the adverse effect that would have on the Tennessee Valley economy. That's what we're playing with, and that's right now. Right now. Within two years, we'll be lucky if we ever see a deficit that is less than a trillion dollars a year, according to the Congressional Budget Office. So I'm going to mention a couple of votes that we had recently, and then I'm uh, going to go ahead and sit down. But if you're looking for a go-along, get-along kind of guy, or a big spending establishment kind of guy, you don't want to vote for me. If you want another big spending congressman in Washington, D.C., who doesn't care about the financial risk of what we're doing to the future of our country, then you might want to consider one of the other candidates, but not Mo Brooks. We had a vote a couple of weeks ago, two key votes. The first vote, well, let me back up. Wednesday night, there's a bill introduced to spend $1.3 trillion dollars. It's over 2,200 pages long, okay? And on Thursday morning, we start debating, and sometime around noon or early uh, afternoon, we have a vote on what's called the rule. And what the rule does is it establishes the terms by which you debate the passage of a bill. And that rule said, we are going to vote on that 2,200 page $1.3 trillion spending bill today. Now, you remember Nancy Pelosi? We've got to pass the bill to find out what's in it. Your Republicans just did that to you. There's no way in the world that anyone in the United States Congress had enough time to read that legislation and understand what all it was doing. No chance. No one can read and understand 2,200 pages in less than 24 hours. Yet that is the rule that we, the Republicans, passed by which we were going to evaluate that piece of legislation. And out of the Alabama delegation, your congressman is the only one who voted no and was consistent with our 2010 argument against Nancy Pelosi. Every other Republican congressman from the state of Alabama and 200 and so other Republicans across the country voted yes to shut out the American people from understanding this 2,200 page bill that's spending $1.3 trillion. And you'll recall President Trump wasn't too happy with that. On Friday, he said, it's never happening again. I'll sign it this time, but this process is never happening again. There are only 25 Republicans who voted against that process out of roughly 240. Then later that day, when we voted to spend $1.3 trillion, about $800 billion of it that we don't have, have to borrow to get and can't afford to pay back, there were only two Republicans from the state of Alabama who voted no, myself and Gary Palmer from Birmingham. That was it, folks. And we got to get some people in Washington, D.C. who don't just act like conservatives, who have some kind of understanding of economic principles, and who know that you cannot borrow your way into prosperity, and who have the backbone not to sell our country out to our creditors. And that's where I am. opportunity for Q&A. I've just focused the meat of my remarks on that one subject matter, but that's because it has the capability, that one issue, of doing more damage to our country, wreaking more havoc, putting us in the worst position, uh, perhaps in American history, with the possible exception of the Civil War. That's what kind of damage is caused by an insolvency of the central government. Look at Puerto Rico, look at Venezuela, look at Greece to get an idea of what happens. Look at a number of other countries if you wish, but those are the most current. So I'm your Congressman Mo Brooks. I ask for your vote on June 5th, and of course against the Democrat come November. Y'all have a good day. Mo, if you don't mind coming back up, you mentioned sure. Q&A. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we'll do... A, a you mean I can talk some more? Yeah, about five minutes. <laughs> about five minutes, I want to take questions. Um, and, and as you're thinking on questions, I do just want to reiterate, you know, a 
lot of people just say that America is a democracy, but, but we're a representative, demo representative democracy. So what that means is Mr. Brooks is in Washington to represent the values that we all believe in. And I know that 90% of the people in this room are hardcore conservatives. And like he said, he's got the background to prove it, he's got the track record to prove it, he's got the voting record to prove it. So I thank you for doing that. I thank you for... No, my pleasure. Thank you for coming to the Yeah, thank you for that. Questions about any subject matter, I've already hit on deficit and debt. That's the 800 pound drill. Yes. I just, want, I just want to know, Congressman, when you were stayed in the Alabama State House, you must have stayed in the doghouse a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when I was elected back in 1982 uh, to the Alabama House, uh, we were outnumbered 129 Democrats to 11 Republicans. And we were outnumbered. Uh, 31 to 0 in statewide offices, and I remember when I first announced, I was in my 20s at the time, uh, someone said, you're going to run as a Republican? You can't win as a Republican. And I said, well, I'd rather lose as a Republican than win as a Democrat. Okay? Because of the belief system. I've seen Jimmy Carter, and I've seen Ronald Reagan, and there was a big gap between those belief systems. And the gap now is even bigger between the two political parties, although unfortunately a lot of our establishment folks vote like a lot of the more moderate uh, Democrats do, and that's costing us severely in Washington, D.C. But we, and yes, I did. I, I could give you some, I, do y'all remember when you got computers back then? Y'all were in the, were you in the legislature? When they allowed computers on the House floor? <laughs> information on uh, tax increases and I got the legislative fiscal office note and I also got the um, uh, the actual copy of the vote in the House and the Senate and I gave it to the taxpayers defense fund and they put together a report and it it got a lot of incumbents uncomfortable and beat in the 1986 elections because they were going back home saying oh no I didn't vote for any of these tax increases well, here was their vote, and here was the fiscal office report on how much revenue is going to be generated by that tax increase for that vote. And, and apparently every challenger somehow or another in the state of Alabama got a copy of that. And one of the <coughs> highest compliments I ever got, and this is going to be recorded, these are somebody else's words, not mine, okay, <laughs> was after a, 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 an incumbent by the name of Carl Brakefield in Walker County had been defeated in a Democratic primary. And he sat right behind me and said, Mo Brooks, you're lower than well shit in the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> and I said, thank you, Carl. <laughs> and also after uh, the 86 elections, because there were so many Democrats that got beat, uh, we made pretty good strides. I think we got into the 20s <laughs> in 1986. Um, once we got up there, I had a big, lunky suitcase type of uh, computer. We called that a laptop back then, okay, but I'm, it must have weighed 30 pounds. And they banned computers from the House floor. And that was the Mo Brooks rule that stayed in place for 12 years. So I don't know if you're in office in the 1990s or not. You have still been a teenager or something? I got like three and a half years ago. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Yes, ma'am. Well, I understand the importance of border control and how important it is to protect our border. What would it take to stop giving these people coming across the border? All kinds of money, place to stay. I mean, how much of our money is going just for that? It looks like that'd be enough money to take care of a lot of problems right there. The best analysis I've seen of the cost of illegal aliens, every which way you can think of cost, is a net tax loss to cities, counties, states, and the federal government of $116 billion a year. That's the net tax loss. Um, the illegal aliens generate about $20 billion in revenue, some Social Security money, sales taxes, things of that nature, but they consume, roughly speaking, according to this estimate, $136 billion a year in services and other costs. For a net tax loss to all of us, $116 billion, you could build four walls a year, real walls, for that kind of money. What would it take to, to get that done? The Democrats aren't going to do it, and our Chamber of Commerce Republicans are hesitant to do it. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce's number one priority is flooding the labor market with foreign workers. Now, they prefer legal foreign workers over illegal aliens, 
because they don't want their members run potentially afoul of the law. But their leadership has, on a regular basis, said this is our number one uh, priority over everything else. And they're willing to spend tens of millions of dollars per election cycle in order to make sure that they elect people who are not for protecting American jobs for American workers, okay? And on the Democrat side, they have figured out that they cannot win elections in the United States of America as easily, as easily, if they have to rely on American voters. So what they're trying to do is import foreign workers who over time, they hope, will start voting either legally or illegally, and that with that extra oomph, that extra vote, that will put them into the White House perpetually and in control of the House and the Senate perpetually. So that's where the Democrats are. They're doing it strictly out of pure, raw, partisan politics in order to consolidate power or gain power. And then you've got, unfortunately, the Chamber of Commerce, which is a fairly financially wealthy institution, putting a lot of money into establishment Republicans who don't want strong border security, and that's our challenge. We have to get voters who can figure all this stuff out and elect more of us that believe in border security and understand the damage being done by our current immigration policy. And as I say that, let me just emphasize this one thing. Our lawful immigration system, folks, is far and away the most generous on the planet. We give out our highest honor citizenship to almost as many people born in foreign lands as every other country on the planet combined. Almost as much as all the others combined. So don't any, let anyone tell you that we're heartless in our wanting to enforce our borders with respect to illegal aliens when our lawful immigration policy is so expansive compared to every other country. Other any questions? Other? Yes, sir. Uh, Good Congressman, you. thank you for what you do. Thank you for, uh, you know, we saw you at the Google thing today. Thank you for the work you've done on that. I know that you and, and Senator Livingston, and Representative uh, Haynes and Horton have worked hard on it, continue to work hard on Bell Fund, and we thank you for it. Um, I just have a question, first of all, too. Thank you for educating us on these things. I think this financial, uh, you know, these the, the money issues we have is the great challenge of our time, and thank you for the leadership you've shown on it. Simply, though, I just want to know, you mentioned a minute ago, $800 billion we would uh, be sure if, if our creditors quit loaning to us. Is that a, a year, or how, what time span is that $800 million <coughs> per billion? In? Let me give you a little bit of history very quickly. We had four years in the Obama administration where we had trillion dollar year deficits. In the middle of those years, we captured the House. And we were dedicated, mm -hmm. as long as Obama was president, we were dedicated to trying to get our financial house in order. In 2015, that one fiscal year, we got the deficit down to $439 billion. So we've made pretty good strides. From the worst year to that year was about a trillion dollar year improvement. Then we went from $438, 39000000000 billion to $585 billion in fiscal year 2016 to $666 billion in 2017, and now we're looking at $804 billion this year, mm -hmm. $900 and some odd billion next year, and by 2020 now, according to the CBO, these are their numbers, not mine, mm -hmm. we're looking at a trillion dollar year deficit per year, okay. for each year, until such time as we collapse. Yeah. And we've got the Congressional Budget Office, the Comptroller General of the United States, and the Government Accountability Office, all telling us in writing that the financial path we're on is unsustainable, which is accounting language for insolvency and bankruptcy. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, who's the director of Office of Management and Budget, a friend of mine, we've talked many times uh, over the years while he was in Congress, uh, he's also of the mind that we're headed to a, a bankruptcy insolvency. And we have to do whatever it takes to prevent that from happening because there will be a lot of loss of life and a lot of economic destruction that ensues is suddenly the federal government collapses because it can't pay its bills. If there's a sudden cutoff, I mean, I can, I can go through the cascading effects, but it's scary. That's why I say that the only period of time that probably would be worse in American history would be the Civil War, and you know how devastating that was with the loss of uh, hundreds of thousands of um, American lives. Thank you. Any other questions?
If not, we've got other speakers. There, I don't want to take up their time. No, you're okay. Yeah, I do have. I have one question. Um, you know, you mentioned how a creditor and a, and a someone receiving those funds, how you know that kind of reduces their sovereignty. And I think, you know, us as a state with such a large percentage of our state funds that we receive from the national government being earmarked for specific things, I think we sacrifice as a state some of our sovereignty because to receive those funds, we're then dictated how those funds can be spent. We don't make those decisions as a state. So how can we regain our sovereignty? Well, you need to elect more people who have read the Tenth Amendment, who believe in states' rights and the principles of federalism that our founding fathers established when they wrote the Constitution. Uh, I'm one of those, say, with uh, K-12 through education, the federal government needs to butt out. Every single mandate we have, even the, <laughs> even the good mandates that we have, we need to repeal, because that is not a federal government responsibility. If we had the money and we want to help with money, that's a whole different issue, okay? But in terms of there being a quid pro quo, we'll give you this money if you do this thing, the federal government needs to get out of attaching those kind of strings and defer to the collective judgment of our city, county, and state officials. Uh, quite frankly, one of the biggest problems we face in Washington is we're expected to know everything. Every public policy issue there could possibly be, we're expected to know it because we're going to have to vote on it. And there's not a single person in the United States of America that has the mental capacity to fully understand the cascading effects of every single public policy issue that we're expected to know. And that's because the federal government is now into everything. And we need to defer to cities, counties, and states what has historically for centuries been their bailiwick and trust them to do the right thing. If they do the wrong thing, well, then the voters can change that. But we need to focus on national security as the number one thing. And there are some other things dealing with international affairs or, or interstate uh, transactions, things of that nature that are federal government in nature. Uh, but everything else, Folks at City, County, State, go for it. Please do right. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you questions? so much. You know, if, if for no other reason um, than the fact that he is the only U.S. congressman to ever use his belt as a tourniquet, he deserves your vote. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Brooks. Um, the next candidate we'll have up is Mr. Scott Dawson. He's running for the governor of Alabama. Um, I want to thank you for your race, and I want to thank you for um, the integrity that you, you carry yourself with. You know, I think when you look at some of the things our state's facing right now, I think integrity is, is an issue that we're uh, going to have to improve on. I think in a lot of ways our voters don't trust that the people that were elected are men of integrity. And I know that Scott will talk about his history and will talk about the things that he's done in ministry and all of those things. Um, but I know that for me, that's that's very important to the future of our state. So, uh, Mr. Scott Dawson, thank you. Sir. Thank you. I will just uh, echo everyone else's remarks. Thanks to the young Republicans of Northeast Alabama. Uh, John Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership, and I think what you've seen is what leaders have to do. And uh, as we've gotten into tonight, I uh, man, thank you, Congressman Brooks. Uh, Thursday night. We have a debate, the first gubernatorial debate, and um, we're, uh, we're kind of upset that Governor Ivey's not going to be there, but I think I speak for all the other candidates. We're glad you aren't debating against us. <laughs> you would just take us down. And so uh, thank you for your remarks tonight. Uh, how in the world did you get a guy like Scott in the governor's race? Uh, if you were surprised about it, I guarantee you I was shocked about it because this was not a, uh, a sinister plan. This was not something that was developed. Uh, this was something that happened to me over a process. I grew up uh, down in Birmingham, west of Birmingham, a place called Inslee. My wife grew up in Midfield. Went to Inslee High School. Uh, got my master's at uh, um, Beeson Divinity School after going to Sanford University, and we started a ministry, kind of like Billy Graham, but much, much smaller, much smaller. But we work with students. We have a student conference with about 12,000 students for about the last, oh my goodness, uh, 30 years. We work with Major League Baseball. We do things with, uh, the last year we worked with the Cubs, the Mets, and the Royals. And I had my life. I had my lane. I liked it. But then all of a sudden some things started coming up about the former elected governor. 
And I went, oh no, not again. You see, if you, if you really did the studies, you'd find that two of the last three elected governors have been removed from office, both parties. Three of the last six. The real statistic that gets me is in the last 50 years, we've only had two governors in the state of Alabama serve consecutive terms without being impeached, indicted, or arrested. And I went, that's enough. I'm, I'm done with this. We've got to do something about it. I became part of a grassroots organization. I honestly just wanted to find somebody. I just wanted to find somebody that wouldn't uh, melt when the lights got on and wouldn't uh, compromise when the pressure got tough. And to my surprise, everybody started looking at me and went, we think you're the one. And uh, I turned it down a couple of times and they came to me and being in ministry, they gave me the preacher talk and said, just pray about it. Now, if you're in church, you know when the preacher says, just pray about it, that's translated you're going to do it. You just don't know it yet. So that's what happened to me. They said, pray about it. And I went through 21 days. And during that process, I had what I would call a burning bush moment. And we put our yes on the table. Uh, my wife and the kids, they were already on board. They are like, Dad, this would be phenomenal for you. We believe you could do it. But I was like, guys, y'all don't understand how nasty Alabama politics can be. And I was, I, I, I'll be honest, I was a little afraid. And it was my wife who gave me the response. She said, "Can you? you're the preacher. Can you find anywhere in Scripture where fear is the reason you don't follow after God's call? Mm -hmm. And with that, I was kind of bound where I needed to be. And man, we started going out and meeting people all around our state. And it's been a, it's been a joy. Uh, we've got some great people in our state. We got, we've got some great people running for office. It's been a pleasure meeting men and women who are putting their name out. And be honest, if anyone, I, as I've walked through this, I'm telling you, if you put your name out there, uh, congratulations. Because it's not something you do flippantly. It's an agonizing journey. And so as I've been out there, I, I know that you have questions. In fact, I've had questions. Two years ago, I was sitting in your seat. We'd have candidates come in, and I'd want to ask them questions. And the first question to me is always about character. When you mention about integrity, I want to know about a person's character. You cannot sidestep that. And it's about time we realize character is not built during an election year. There is a major difference between integrity and image. Image is what other people think about you. Image is a 30-second commercial. Integrity is who you are when no one's watching. If now, ever, ever before, we need to elect men and women of integrity. And when you think about character, to me, I, I'll get out in front and just tell you, I make decisions based through a, a biblical worldview. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I realize Alabama's not creating a theocracy. You're not electing a minister. You're electing a governor. But do not be naive. Anyone sitting in the governor's chair will make a decision based on some sort of authority in his or her life. We just hope it's not the special interest groups whispering in their ear. We need someone fighting for Alabama, Alabama values. And so when I say character, when I say biblical worldview, if you're in this room and you say, well, I don't agree with you in matters of faith, where do I fit into this uh, a Rubik's Cube? Well, let me tell you what Scripture says. Scripture teaches to treat every person with respect. If you did a word study on that word, you'd find the word respect means to hold in high value, high regard. You know, you have to ask yourself, when did civility die in our country? Do y'all remember the good old days when all we argued about in Alabama was college football, you know? But now we argue about everything. If we don't agree on everything 100%, we almost have to fight each other. There has to be a time when we can agree to disagree but still live in a community. So the first thing I always want to hear about is character, especially in the governor's race. You know the last time uh, someone uh, was elected in Alabama as governor without any prior political experience? Does anybody know? Bob, Bob, James. Bob James. 1978. Very good. When he was elected, there's a book out named Fog, okay? You can buy it on Amazon or look it up on Google. Anyway, uh, and, and, when you, and, and when you get it in the mail, you know what you're going to find? If you read that book, it was published in 1990. And the book says that when Fog James was elected, there were three issues that had to be addressed in the state of Alabama. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 1978. May I remind you? Here they are. 
roads, prison overcrowding, and education. Does that sound familiar to everyone? <coughs> it's been four decades, and we're still dealing with the same issues. We, kick, we keep kicking the can down the road, but we're running out of roads. We've got to start doing something. So when we talk about character, I think it's about acting with honor. It's not just campaigning on something. It's actually doing it. So the first question I always have is character. The second question I always have about candidates that now people are asking about me, this is probably what you're asking about me tonight, is the idea of competence. I want to know, can you do the job? I may agree with you, but I want to make sure you're going to be effective. And that's probably where some of you are tonight. You're going, what do you know about politics, Scott? You're a preacher, to which I must remind you, I've worked in church for 30 years. I know politics pretty well, okay? Like, Y'all been there, amen on that, okay. Uh, I mean, you have to know how to work through this thing. But let me just share with you a little bit about competence. Um, if, if we were able to develop SDEA, we grew up from the ground floor up. In fact, I just ask you to check out the candidates. I'm not sure what other people do or what they've done. We've started SDA. It's, it's a ministry, but for 30 years we've had consecutive growth. We're run by a board of directors. I know how to operate within an organization, but you also got to realize we deal with pastors. Don't discount pastors. They're CEOs, and they don't always agree on everything. And when I was in New York City, I'm going to say I believe, I believe somehow that was a precursor for me to be in this race today. It's the most pluralistic society I think we have in America. And we had them coming from all walks of life. And to corral those people together and move them towards one common goal, I started thinking about it. You know, Congressman, I, I may not be a good congressman. may not be a good senator. Because that's a policy. You're in those policy meetings. But you know what a governor does? A governor casts a vision. A governor has to work across the lines and draw all people together and build a consensus. And we may agree to disagree on some things. We've got to find where we can find common ground and move them towards a goal. And I started thinking about Montgomery. It's a fact. We've got a super majority of Republicans in Montgomery. This is our time to get stuff done. And you're going to have some candidates come in and say, you know what we need? We need a business person. Other people are going to come in and say, no, 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 we need a seasoned politician. I think now more than ever, Alabama needs a leader. Alabama needs a leader that can cast a vision to this next generation and articulate it in a way to bring unity to our state. Because ladies and gentlemen, we go back for 40 years, we've been dealing with education. you got to admit, aren't you tired? of all the stats coming out that it always seems that we're 48, 49, or 50. Pre-K, we'll make it available, but I'm never going to make it mandatory because my fundamental principle is that government will never do a better job with children than parents. Parents will always do that. We're already fully funding pre, uh, uh, kindergarten, and then they tell us that prison systems will determine how many beds they will have in the future years based on how many children who cannot read by third grade. Y'all heard it? Y'all know it. We start thinking of all the million dollar incentives that we have to get involved with this, and I started thinking, you know what? This is Alabama. I look around and I see a huge group, I see an army of volunteers. I see men and women who wouldn't mind donating some of their time to show up inside of an elementary school and help young boys and young girls who maybe come from homes where mom and dad can't help them. What if it would be like this? Between first and third grade, we had mentors in the classroom under the supervision of a teacher. Having a proper background check that I think a lot of the volunteers would pay for it themselves. That by third grade, we could have an initiative where every child in the state of Alabama is reading, writing, and doing correct arithmetic. It could change the future of our state. In middle school, let's start teaching leadership. My goodness, let's start teaching that every middle schooler is already a CEO. Because if you're a CEO, you act a lot different than just checking in and checking out as a part-time employee. When you get to high school, as you probably have heard, I'm proposing when there's drastic times, it calls for drastic actions. And ladies and gentlemen, we have been, we, we 
we have a crisis among us called drug addiction. You know what I've realized about drug addiction? It doesn't know a gender. It doesn't know a race. It doesn't know a socioeconomic status. It attacks everyone. There's not a family in this room who hadn't walked through drug addiction in your family. You know what I want to do? In ninth grade, I want to, I want to propose mandatory drug testing for any and all extracurricular activities. Not random, but across the board. I've talked to enough small business owners who can't find employees who they can hire that can pass a drug test. So if we get into ninth grade and we start finding this drug test, everybody says, well, okay, how are you going to pay for it? Can I just offer this to you? I've been raising money since I was 18 years of age for ministry, and I, I'm just going to submit to you, do you not think corporations like Google, others, Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A, if we could offer them a partnership to help us eradicate drug addiction in high schools in the state of Alabama, ladies and gentlemen, they would be lined up from here to Bridgeport saying we want a part of that. So when you think about this, all I'm trying to do is not hurt teenagers. I'm trying to help them. I've had the privilege of speaking in 2,000 junior and senior high schools across the country. And I've seen it firsthand. You've seen it firsthand. We've got to start doing something. When we find them addicted, we've got to offer them help. Just like Judge Jones was talking about earlier. You've got to offer not only state-based drug rehab. That's not very effective. But you've got to open up the door to faith-based drug rehabilitation. That we can hopefully restore some of these young men and young ladies and get them back into our communities. I grew up in Inslee, and I'm just going to tell you tonight, there's not one mom in Inslee praying for her son or daughter to be, to, to be incarcerated in some bigger, better, privatized prison. They're praying, God, you better, you better get a hold of him. Because there's nothing I can do for him. And that prayer is replicated all across our state. It is called a correctional facility. It's not a generational facility. And now we're seeing second and third generations start to happen. So as I, I, we could talk all night about this. Let me move on because I know we do have other speakers. Let me just tell you the third question I would have. Chance. I, I could look at him and say, man, I like that guy. I believe like that guy. I like some of his out-of-the-box thinking. But does he have a chance? And with that, I would just submit to you, when I got into this, I had to figure out my pathway. I could stand before you tonight and say, I want to play in the NBA. Look at me, there's no chance, okay? I am not playing in the NBA. So I had to figure out, is there an opportunity? When I jumped in, there were 12 candidates and more on the way. Now it's dwindled down to, there's five official, four that we can find, okay? And, and what we're doing with this is that we're looking at, in 50, huh? In 57 days, but who's counting? There's going to be a primary here in the state of Alabama. In that, on that day, you've got to look at the candidates that are coming towards this office. And when I announced, I announced on the Rick and Bubba show. He's my best friend on the planet, Rick Burgess. As you probably know, he was speaking at our conference when his son Bronner passed away. What most people don't know is my wife was in the hospital with his wife walking through this tragic incident. When you walk through something like that, you galvanize. And I think he said it best. He said, I'm not endorsing Scott. Endorsement is a political statement. He says, I'm vouching for Scott. That's a whole different level. When we announced, we had over 7,000 Alabamians sign up to be a part of this campaign. From that moment, it has just kind of escalated. For 30 years, I've crisscrossed this state. Some candidates say they visited all 67 counties. <laughs> I've preached in all 67 counties, so I, I've been there, they've been me. The only one who knows more back roads is probably John Merrill, and I'm going to let him keep that going. Okay, but anyway, um, so for me, when I stand before you, what is my ultimate goal? My ultimate goal is what happened when Nick Saban came to Tuscaloosa. When Nick Saban took over in Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa he took a team that for 15 years had kind of been mediocre, but his second year there, they went undefeated in the regular season. Fast forward to today, they're the standard by which other teams are measured. Now, Auburn has won a national championship in that time frame. So you know what you realize? When the water goes up, all the ships rise. The Southeastern Conference is the toughest conference in the nation. You say, what happened? You know what happened? It was a change of mindset. 
And those men walked on the field, they realized they were going to win. You know what? I, I look across this state. Man, I, I want us to win. It's time for us to win. I mean, you think about it. We've we got the greatest state in the union. Amen? Amen. If you get somebody to move down from the north, we can't get rid of them. I mean, they, they <laughs> love Alabama. I mean, you know? And when I look out there, I see the smiles right now. That's what I want to see in Alabama. I want us to smile about Alabama instead of smirk about Alabama politics. It's time for us to turn the frown upside down. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a preacher, so I'm bringing you to the invitation. I'd love to earn your vote on June 5th. And I'd love to earn your support. I know it's outside the box, but wouldn't you think it's time to turn the page in the history of Alabama politics? I know you can't endorse us and some of you on the executive committee and things like that, but don't worry, we've got somebody in the parking lot. They're putting bumper stickers on every one of your cars. So thank you all for your support. Uh, look out for us. If you want to know more about our platform, we've got uh, uh, pamphlets here. We've got signs. I'll stick around and answer any question you've got. Thank you all so much. May God bless you. Thank you for being here as well, Scott. And uh, same with Mo. We have a couple minutes. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule. So we'll take a couple minutes if you don't care to join me and do some quick questions from the audience. So. Anybody want to start us off with some questions yeah, for I'm Mr. Right. Dawson? Oh, okay. right. So if you're elected, how would you react as governor if federal legislation passed that infringes on the Second Amendment, specifically a ban on semi-automatic weapons? Oh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, where's that Tenth Amendment? Dr. Right? Right. Where's that Tenth Amendment? <laughs> we got state rights. No, you, I mean, understand, that is a constitutional right. So we will always fight for Second Amendment rights for the state of Alabama. If the, if the federal legislators go up against it, I think we got one that's going to fight for us. I think we got a president that's going to stand with us. I think right now we continue to move forward. So if, they, if, they, if that's a hypothetical question, then we will stand strong on the Second Amendment and protect the Second Amendment in the state of Alabama. Does that help? Yes, sir. I like it. I like it. Well, you had to read it. I was like, oh, you thought about that one. That's good. All right, any other questions? Yes. Oh, Doc. Doc. Wayne. Yeah. Remember, we're friends. Okay, no, I'm sorry. You know, you talk about education, and the governor, you know, the governor has a position on the State Board of Education. Oh, yes. A very prominent position. And how are you going to handle that? Well, I've... Uh, I've so the State Board really does. There are only eight of us. Right. Be number nine. Well, one thing is you got to show up for the meetings. You can't leave by absenteeism. I think that, as every one of these uh, men would say, it's not... It is the it's it's the it's the most expensive thing on our budget. It's it's the number one thing. So you got to show up. Uh, yeah, I know you've been with me. I was the one who tweeted out it's time to re get rid of Common Core and bring back Common Sense. And and here's what I've understood about Common Core. It's not that we're against standards. I think that's very it's it's necessary for us to understand. We're not trying to get rid of standards in education. We just don't want. An edu a, a standard that comes with a with a world view from California or Illinois. We want Alabama values for Alabama students taught by Alabama teachers. That's what we want. So when you're showing up, you can cast a vision. Uh, you you may only be one of of nine, but you have a very large microphone to be able to get everything done that we can. I want to see Alabama start moving. Uh, towards that 26, 27 mark. We all want to be number one. Let's just get out of the 40s. Amen? Let's just get out of the 40s and start moving. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do, you, do you have any idea why Governor Ives is not going to be in the debate? Can you give us a hint? They're recording this, man. <laughs> uh, 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 we, we have been told that, um, that there are conflicts and schedules. I will just tell you, uh, for me, uh, I was already scheduled to speak to pastors in Kansas City for a Kansas City Royals event. And what I've done is I've been able to manipulate my schedule to be in Birmingham, to be in Kansas City, to be back. Because I, I believe in, um, in Alabama, you deserve to know our visions, you deserve to know the distinctions between the candidates. And I think it's, it's, 
it's pretty important for all of us to recognize that, um, that right now, if I were to give you an analogy in the football state, we're being told we have a head coach, but we really have an interim head coach because we fired our previous head coach, and we are now searching for a permanent head coach. And for you to assume that it is just given to you could be dangerous. So I'm trying to be straightforward. I'm not trying to give you a political answer. I'm just trying to also uphold not trying to slander someone. I, I think the problem in Alabama politics is most of the time we run against each other. And when that happens, we lose. And so I have not spoken privately with anybody. Hopefully I've dealt with that with dignity and, and, and respect. So, Any other questions? Because y'all are good folks. Thank you. Thank y'all so much. Thank you again for being here, Scott. Uh, the third and final candidate we'll have up tonight uh, is Representative Will Ainsworth. He's been uh, the representative for District 27 in Alabama for three and a half years now, not not 25. Or <laughs> <laughs> you just look more experienced. All <laughs> dead. Uh, but anyway, he's, he's did a lot of incredible things in the legislature, and again, you know, maybe it's because they're here for our event, but I just got to, you know, brag on you a little bit for some of the conservative values that you've represented in Montgomery thus far. Um, you know, my wife works uh, for a lot of the representatives, and, and, you know, she has a lot of stories about uh, you putting in extra hours and going the extra mile to make sure that you're representing your constituents well. So, thank you for being here. Will Ainsworth. Absolutely. First off, I want to thank everybody that's running. I mean, I think, I forget who said it, maybe, uh, but if you're actually putting your hat in the ring, if you're running, and if you care enough, you know, thank you all. I mean, that's, you know, the first step. And I think one of our colleagues on the House spoke the last day, it was his final, he believes in term limits, served eight years, guy named Mark Tuggle. One of the things he talked about is if you're going to complain, um, you know, then get involved. And he kind of directed at the media that, you know, it's easy for the media just to take shots at people, you know, to sit there from the sidelines, but, you know, it's hard to actually get engaged. I want to say this, y'all got a great delegation. Senator Livingston does a tremendous job in the Senate. You know, Representative Haynes and Representative Wharton are good friends of mine and do a great job in the House. And congrats on Google. I mean, how exciting is that? And uh, for them to bring a $100,000 check for your county schools, I mean, that's the type of business you want to get in that North Alabama. So, tell y'all a little bit about myself and then why I decided to run. Y'all can get home. I uh, appreciate you coming out and caring. Uh, you know, probably one of the biggest disappointments since I got elected is how little people care, how little they're engaged in our process. And forgot about you. Appreciate your conservative stance in D.C. We need more people like you and hope you get reelected. So, thanks for all you do for Alabama, Congressman Brooks. Real quick, this I grew up in Boaz, not far from here. Um, grew up in the business world. I think that matters. I think we need, uh, and I think one of the things I want to encourage you to do is look at your candidates and look at their backgrounds and find out, you know, how did they grow up? What is their core values? What do they understand? What have they done in their life? I think that's important. I went to Auburn, met my wife Kendall there. She's from Tupelo, Mississippi. Any of y'all that know her know she's wonderful. And if you look on the back of my flyer, that's our family. We've got three kids, uh, Hunter and Hayes, twin boys that are eight. Scott, don't tell Hunter he can't play in the NBA. You know, just because he's, uh, he thinks, uh, I'm just kidding, but he, uh, he, they're really into sports. Right now they play baseball and basketball, but he, he honestly believes Hunter does. He's going to play at Kentucky and then go to the NBA. And I was like, practice hard, buddy. So, uh, yeah, but uh, then I got a daughter, Addie, that's six, and she's uh, real into gymnastics and cheerleading. And so, and, but I want to say this, all the wives of these candidates, the uh, wives of candidates running, I mean, it's amazing, the spouse, because to, you know, certainly, you know, put up with it being gone, to put up with the schedule, to actually subject yourself to being attacked, I mean, you know, they, we owe them a huge round of applause for everything they do, so make sure you thank them. You know, I got involved, probably the number one thing I got asked, I got asked tonight, is why did you decide to run for office? And I never had a desire to be in politics. I really didn't. Um, I obviously voted and always voted Republican. And then I got sick and tired of what was going on under President Obama and what the liberals were doing to our country and decided to run for the House four years ago in 2014. 
got elected to be one of the most liberal trial lawyers uh, that was in the House, um, and went to Montgomery and will I realized that you know there's a lack of vision, there's a lack of leadership, and we can do better. And you know we've done a lot of good things. You know, if you look at these guys right here. We've helped kill over a billion dollars in taxes that would have impacted y'all. Republicans, you know, and so we've stood up and fought the good fight when we're down there. Let me talk to you about what I want to do because I talked about, you know, we need leaders that have a vision for our state. You heard a lot of these guys talk about it. The you know, first thing is, and probably the saddest thing, I've heard Scott say this before, but, you know, you hear often people say, you know, we're tired of being embarrassed, you know, we just want somebody that won't embarrass us. I mean, what a low bar to set. But I think that's really the reality now in Alabama. And I want y'all to know, you know, I served as a youth pastor in my church. You know, I became a Christian after I went to, I remember, I came home from a vacation Bible school, had great parents, prayed to see Christ. Why do I tell you that? Because my values come from my faith. That's what defines me. That's what actually, you know, when I go to Montgomery, is going to determine how I act. And, you know, so I want you to know that because integrity matters. But also I think, you know, my integrity comes from my faith, and that's important. I didn't even see you. How are you, man? I didn't saw you earlier. Yeah, so it's, you do a great job volunteering all up here. Second thing, though, is education. When I ran, you know, I was tired of the regulations impacting our, of the business that we face. And I was sick of it, really. And so that's really kind of what drove me. Here's what I've realized since being in Montgomery. If we're going to move Alabama forward, we've got to do a better job in education. I want to give you three points that we can do. First is technology. If we're going to compete in a 21st century economy, we better make sure our kids have access and availability to technology. One of the things we did in the House of Senate this year is a broadband bill. Senator Schofield, my neighbor in Marshall County, one of your good friends, you know, he helped lead that. We pushed through the House to get that done. But here's why that's important. If a kid just doesn't understand technology, I mean, heck, we've got a farmer in our place in Marshall County, the tractor drives itself. All right, technology is the future. We've got to make sure Alabama can compete with anybody in the world. Right now, that's not the case, especially in county and rural school systems. The kids really get left behind. I want to change that and push for more funding and technology to make sure all kids, no matter where you live, have access and availability. It's important. Second thing is pre-K, and I agree with you know, Scott, it doesn't need to be mandatory, right? It's the job of parents. I totally believe that. But guess what the reality is in Alabama? A lot of kids, you know, they have parents that don't care. And so I wanted to learn more about education. I went and sat down with every grade um, and all the teachers in my district because, you know, I'm not an education major. And I said, what can I do to help you? And here's what's interesting I want you all to realize. Kindergarten teachers said, Will, we need help. Parents aren't doing their job anymore. And I said, what do you mean? They said, and this is the most critical time of a child's brain developing. You know, three, four, five. And so you've got kids that going into kindergarten, they've never been read to. They don't know that your sweater's red. You know, they don't know that, you know, my sign's blue. They don't know that, all right? They don't understand just basic stuff that all of us take for granted that we enjoy doing as parents, right? I mean, those are things we want to do. And so what's happened is we have generations of kids, the same as generational poverty, we have generations of kids where parents don't care. They really do not care. And so pre-K gives those kids in that situation hope. My vision for Alabama is any kid that would like to have pre-K to be able to have access to it. When we've done that, we can check that box and say, you know what, job well done here. Third thing is workforce development. And I think it's the biggest crisis facing our state. Um, and here's why I think we've got an aging workforce that's getting older. When I talk to businesses across the state, what do they tell me? Will, we need help. Right here, Harvin Automotive. Wynn and Tanner, good friends of mine, supporting our campaign. You know, they need more automotive techs. We've got to do a better job of making sure education cranks out the needs of industry. All right, and so what, how do I think we got that wrong in Alabama? When I was in school, Cole, when you were in school, you know, a lot of times it was how are you, I don't know about you, Senator, maybe when you're in school, but, uh, you know, but certainly the question was this, how are you doing in your ACT and where are you going to college, right? That was the question that was asked. I mean, we didn't think anything about it. You know, we wanted to do well and get ready to go to college. Well, here's the reality. In Alabama, 65% of our students do not get a two or four year degree. 65%. So we're getting everybody college ready. We're getting them ready and then we kick them out the door when they graduate, but they're not job ready. My vision for Alabama that I think all of our visions should be, and we've certainly started to work on this in the legislature, is to get people job ready. In Marshall County, we started a program called Project Graduation. 
It uh, takes kids uh, basically in ninth grade and starts getting them career focused. You know, what do you actually want to do with your life when you graduate? And we're working on developing an app. This would be statewide. And uh, so in each county, it would list all the jobs within a 60 mile radius. And it would actually tell people, you know, okay, you know, if you want to be a welder, you know, you need to get trained, you need to be certified. If you want to be an accountant, you need to go to college, get your, and then, you know, obviously become a CPA. So the thing we found out is kids don't understand the opportunities out there. They don't understand the skill set. They certainly don't understand the soft skills. But Congressman, we got a lot of these kids, you know, they have to send their girlfriend in to do an interview for them. I mean, this is a problem that I hear from business owners, you know, right? Y'all, I mean, y'all hire people all the time. The final thing is this I want to talk to you all about is I think the next five, I agree with Tom, the next five to ten years is going to be bright. I think y'all are well positioned here. Uh, I think North Alabama, you know, is well positioned. I think with President Trump, isn't it great to have a businessman that actually understands regulations and is cutting them to actually let business thrive and get government out of the way? I mean, that's what we ran to do. That's what Senator Livingston talked about. That's what I want to do. So I think we're set up to have tremendous amount of success especially up here in North Alabama where Huntsville's booming. So obviously if we want to recruit industry, that's important. And you know, if you look at just what y'all did with Google, we need competent people to recruit industry like y'all done. We also need to help existing industry expand. You know, if you've got a business, you know, Representative Wharton is in the pool business, he wants to go hire two to four additional employees, why should we not give him the same incentives that we give the large corporations? Right, and so, and I believe you grow the base by expanding industry, and that's what we need to do in Alabama, and that's how you grow the economy, not by taxing people. And so, and I, I've fought for that since I've been in Montgomery. If you look at my record, um, you know, I'm one of the most conservative votes there, uh, and it's an honor to serve. I don't want to do this forever. I want to get in, serve, serve well, and go back home. I really think that's the best way to do it. Um, it's been an honor to serve in the House. Um, you know, I'll say this too, I, I think a lot of times, and I've heard different people talk about this, but a lot of times, you know, North Alabama gets left out a lot of times when it comes to funding, when it comes to uh, representation. And that's starting to change some. You know, we've got a speaker from up here, we've got a Senate pro tem. But I mean, I think you've really got to look at where are candidates from so they understand, you know, that, that Hollywood's actually a town in, um, you know, up there close to Mud Creek, not in California, right? I understand that. I'm from this area. I duck kind of up here. I love Jackson County. So I think it matters where people are from. The final thing is this, you know, to Scott's point, do you have a chance to win? You know, we've been really fortunate, had a lot of great people support us. We've raised over $1.3 million. The first half a million we raised, we didn't take a dime of PAC money and not a dime from a lobbyist. You know, it's hard to do. Right? It's hard to do, and a lot of y'all candidates know that. But we're proud of that because it shows that we have people behind us that are ready for a change. Um, Second thing, we've had some great endorsements. Uh, been endorsed by the Farmers Federation, the Forestry, uh, Alabama Building Contractors in North Alabama, the Rick and Bubba Show. They're good friends. Got to know them through ministry. I'm not as close as Scott, but Rick's certainly a mentor of mine. Somebody's had a huge impact on my life. Um, and, you know, we're excited. And I think the thing, too, is, you know, I'm not a career politician. I've only been in politics four years. I think, you know, one of our messages is it's a new day for Alabama. I don't think we can solve the problems that have plagued our states for decades by using the same names over and over on a ballot. And so what I encourage you all to do is, you know, vet your candidates, understand the issues, and, you know, we've got a plan. I want to go down there and work hard, form a consensus, and let's solve some problems that improve Alabama. And uh, great to be here with you all. appreciate you putting this on, Cole. Thanks for everything you've done for, you know, young Republicans all across the state. And, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I'll certainly, if y'all have any questions, answer them. And um, appreciate y'all letting me come. Yeah, go ahead. How do you feel about term limits? I know um, Scott Dawson talked about kicking the can down the road since 1976. I, I think a lot of us are probably aware that some of those same legislators are still in office. Yeah, so I've introduced, uh, I've, I've sponsored and co-sponsored term limit legislation every year I've been down there, so all four years. And then also, uh, and also introduce recall legislation with the idea that if you get elected on one set of values and then you do the exact opposite, the voters ought to have the ability to throw you out. And uh, and the reason I mean, and you know, that all came under Governor Bentley. I also signed with Representative Horton maybe Haynes, I don't remember. But well, I was one of the twelve to sign the articles of impeachment just because, you know, I, I just think what he did was wrong. So but yeah, I'm a big supporter of term limits. I think we need new blood in all of us in Alabama. So thank you. Sometimes that's good. 
but sometimes it's not you. I mean, when you get some good representatives that are doing the right thing, uh, and, and I was a kind of four term limits also, but when you get down there in and you see some of the bad, uh, you know, you want them gone, but when you've got some good representatives, you want them to stay. Yeah. You, you know? And so here's what's interesting. When you look at the corruption that's happened, you know what every person that's been convicted has in common? They knew the system in Montgomery, they've been there too long, and then they gained the system for personal benefit. It doesn't mean that everybody that's down there a long time is a crook, it just means that in statistic-wise, you know, that's what happens. And I think a lot of times, this isn't the case, obviously Congressman Brooks has served and done well, and gets, you know, I mean, he fights for what we want. But a lot of people lose touch of that and do what the special interests want instead of what the people want. And that's one thing I respect about him. He certainly does what the people want, not the, not the interest groups. Yeah. Some of us know what it costs a fortune to run. You're running statewide. It's hard enough for me to find five counties. What can we do about costs of these elections to, to really let, I mean, if you want term limits, you have to have more people able to run. And it's difficult to run. Yeah. Also, it almost costs you a I bet five or six hundred dollars for us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, any type of thing you can do for campaign finance report, I mean, you know, it makes sense. But, I mean, I think at the end of the day, I mean, you know, that's the system we've got. I don't necessarily have any great ideas on you know, how to solve that. I mean, I think one good thing we did in Alabama uh, is eliminate pack to pack transfers, and I'm all for transparency and making sure people know where the money's coming from. And so I think. That's a good thing in Alabama, um, you know, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, it's a right of people to get involved in elections, and, you know, but it's, it sure is frustrating how expensive it is, isn't it? But I just think, you know, what use could that money go to in other ways? So, if you have any ideas, I'm certainly open to them after it, so. I want to let everybody know, too, you challenged uh, Speaker Hubbard right off the bat, and you first year, you challenged Last thing I'll say is this, uh, you know, these guys up here, it's been great to serve with them. Uh, you know, we, we certainly trust God on what's going to happen, but either way, I mean, y'all got great representatives here, great senator, and uh, y'all should be proud of your delegation. They do a good job representing y'all have a lot of integrity. So, great to be with y'all in Jackson County tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one thing I've always appreciated about Will, and I think you saw it demonstrated very well here, um, you know, I think in a lot of times in politics, you see people tell you what you want to hear. They, they, they hear that you hear a question, and you know what answer they want to hear, and they just tell it to you. But Will's always been one that he don't know. He'll just tell you he don't know, but he'll find the answer out. And I think that was a very important part of what you were doing up here. And thank you for your service uh, to the state and the district. So, um, with that being said, that finishes up the candidate seat. No, no, sir. Y'all congratulate uh, <laughs> his wife, Jay, and we'll have a baby. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you all for that. We're, um, we're nervous. Every morning I wake up, and the first thing that I think is, oh, crap. <laughs> Every morning. So. But we're excited. We're excited. That's after the baby. <laughs> sponsored this event for us. He's the one that enabled us to get in this venue uh, and do a lot of the things that we were able to do to make this not happen. So thank you, Steve, for that. And he's always been the one to support us in any way he can. Um, really quick, before we get out of here, um, again, I just want to thank all of you guys for coming out. Um, and, you know, for us as an organization, I, I just want to ask just wholeheartedly for your support. Um, when you look at our demographic, our age demographic, there's not many people in our age demographic, 30, 40 and below, that have conservative values. And, and those people with conservative values are coming fewer and further between. So I think it's important for us as an organization and, and you as a community to make sure that not only this generation has conservative values, but the next one does as well. And that's what we're fighting for, and that's why we want your support. Um, kind of the motto we go by is, is learn today and leave tomorrow, and that's what we're here to do is we're here to learn about conservatism. We're here to learn about these men that are representing us, and we're here 
um, to learn what, what's best for our future. And, and then hopefully in the future when our times come, we can take up the reins that, that these men have, have kind of led the forefront on and, and keep fighting for those things. So, you know, some of the biggest ways you can do that, I, I know social media is huge in today's age. So go check out our Facebook, our website, www.yrnea.org. Um, we're on Twitter and all of those things. Come, come, you know, join us, share, all of those things. Um, and then just keep showing up to events. And we, again, we appreciate all you guys for being here. Any final comments, some events coming up possibly that we want to talk about? The Jackson County Republican Women is having a rally on this coming Saturday on the 14th from 2 to 4 at the Old National Guard Armory. It's now the rescue squad. <coughs> but all, it's an open invitation to all candidates to be there. And try to, the candidates try to be there before 2 o'clock to sign in. Uh, hopefully we're going to have a lot of public there for you to interact with. So, all are invited. All Republican candidates. <laughs> <laughs> any other events coming up or any final words well again thank you all and let's give these candidates a final round of applause what are you doing <laughs>